Welcome to another edition of the Five Star Zone. I'm your host, Rico Beer, Harold Sheldon from the Big Ten Network. Kind enough to join us once again. And Harold, getting ready to come up to week 12. Think about that. Man, this season season is going by so fast. There's still a whole lot we don't know about teams, but we're almost done. We're getting close to the end where most teams have at least two or three more games left, and then that's it. It's bowl season. Let's just jump right into it. One of the teams sitting there, two wins away, is Michigan State. They got at Illinois this weekend, and they are home with Purdue and home with Rutgers to finish out the season. Head coach Jonathan Smith came out and said, look, they they still got a lot of things in front of them, and they're trying to make improvements. For me, I look at this Michigan State team, and really, the goal is to go 3-0. and I mean, these are three winnable games. Vegas has the Illinois game as a minus two and a half, which really means Illinois is getting credit for the game being played in Champaign. That's it. Other than that, it's a flip of a coin. When you look at Michigan State, the last time they had a bye, they came out, they played Iowa, and wow, they look like a totally different team. What should we expect from this Spartan team? And and really, what should we expect from this Illinois team that earlier in the season – They were highly ranked, and I really thought that they were going to do something. They kind of fell back. Indiana's kept winning. What what should we expect in this game? Yeah, it seems like Vegas, for whatever reason, just doesn't really like Illinois. Um, This is the third time I've seen a very interesting home line when it comes to them. Uh, I remember when they were playing Michigan, they were a home underdog. They were a home underdog against Minnesota. And now they're home. They're barely favored against Michigan State, who's four and five. So I feel like these teams are very similar. And I know you, you know, kind of similar to the how you say it, like it's the Spider Man meme. Like, right. It's two quarterbacks who turn the ball over a lot. It's two offensive lines that can't protect the quarterback. There's two run games that are so so. You don't know what when you're gonna get a good one or not. Uh, two teams that have two good receivers and not much else. So it's, it's going to be a very interesting game. Uh, teams are very, very similar. You know, I think if Michigan State might have had Illinois schedule, the record might be similar to theirs uh, instead of having to, you know, play the gauntlet that Michigan State had to. So you know, I think Illinois kind of came back down to earth a little bit. You know, again, they're having trouble, you know, keeping Luke Altmaier upright. Again, these are the two worst teams in terms of protecting the quarterback in the Big Ten. And so I think whichever team is able to do that and not turn the ball over uh, will have the better chance of winning because Luke Altmaier, he was great early on, but now he's turned it over twice in two straight games and he only had four combined in the first seven. I mean, I guess for Michigan State, the biggest problem is the pass rush. One sack going all the way back to September. That's. That's not going to get it done no matter what type of schedule that you play. Can they get to Luke Altmaier is the question because they haven't been able to get any type of pressure, no sacks. I mean, they got to bring a blitz package. Their front four guys just seem they, they can't get to get off quick off the ball, and that's just going to be problematic because you're right. Both quarterbacks are really turnover prone. Childs is looking like he's trying to learn. He's going out of bounds, throwing it out of bounds, but then he still gets tempted to throw into double and triple coverage. Can that Michigan State, I guess, let me go back. Can the Michigan State D-line get any pressure this week, or is this another week, no sacks? They're certainly going to have to. I mean, if they can't get it done this week against a team that's been just as bad as them at protecting the quarterback, then I don't really know when it's going to happen. Um, you know, as we talked about, you know, early on, they had 15 sacks. You know, you're thinking like, okay, these dudes, they, they got out of the portal. They've done a nice mix and match and creating pressure. And after that Boston College game, we really haven't seen it much at all. Um, like you said, it's been over five games now without a sack. I mean, you're talking about since week six, they got the lowest pressure rate in the country, only get home 7% of the time. Uh, just for reference, Wyoming is next at 10% in that range that time range so yeah it's been a problem it's been a huge problem and they're, they're gonna have to find a way to, to scheme up and, and get to Altmaier because Pat Bryant can play as we know Sakari Franklin's explosive so they're, they're gonna have to figure out a way to get home yeah it's almost like you know which receiver Zakari Franklin or Nick Marsh is gonna have that big day or will it be both 
I, I don't know. This this one is just a head scratcher when I look at this game. Michigan State needs the game. Illinois has already got their bowl eligible. Michigan State, if you finish out seven and five, I think it'll be a success for Jonathan Smith. It's not where you want because then you look at BC, who, oh, by the way, Castellanos went into the portal. So, yeah, he, he fell out. He didn't show, he got benched and he didn't show back up to the practice. The Boston College quarterback. Yeah, he hit the portal. So you may see him somewhere else. You look back at that game, that still is one where, man, if if, if Nate Carter could catch that soft pass thrown him yep. in the end zone, it's a different story. You look at the Michigan game, you had an opportunity to to beat the Wolverines. They found a way to cash in off of your mistakes. And and now you you look at this Illinois team. They've gone on the road. You know, they went into Maryland. They found a way to win that game. Like I said, they went to Boston College, should have won that game, went on the road to Michigan, maybe should have won that game. I guess what what will be the difference that, that makes it that Michigan State wins this game and gets that next win and gets them closer to the to the bowl game? Or what is it that Illinois will do that to make sure that Michigan State has to win their final two games? I mean, again, I think it sounds so simple, but just they just have to cut out the mistakes. And that's not just on the field. I mean, we've seen in the, the Michigan game, we had the the delay of game early on, which caused them to not go for it at the two-yard line, back up, miss a field goal. It's little things, you know, one after another, where you add them all together, become one big thing, and they're not talented enough to overcome that. So they have to do what it takes on the field. The coaching staff has to put them in better positions to take advantage when they do, uh, you know, get down in the red zone to score. You know, that's been an issue as we talked about, you know, for previous weeks, you know, whatever reason they get down in the red zone and it just, they just shut it down. They just can't seem to get in the end zone and you can't just rely on Jonathan Kim field goals all the time. Uh, I do think you're going to need some big plays. It's going to take a Nick Marsh taking the top off. It might be one of the running backs, you know, hitting a 30, 40 yard, you know, break a couple tackles and get going downhill. I think it's going to have to be something like that in order for, for Michigan State to come out with this win. Because as we've seen, I don't think they can just go up and down between the 20s and kick field goals. I just don't think that's going to get it done in what could be a lower possession game. And, you know, big plays are going to have to do it. Yeah, that's the other thing that when when I look at it, I mean, it looked it it appeared like that you had a running game, and then all of a sudden you didn't have a running game. So, I mean, Indiana does that to people. So, yeah, if you're MSU, yeah, can you establish a run game? And I think for for state is can you not kick field goals? Uh, I mean, I get it. Jonathan Kim's a great kicker, but. I don't understand what happens to them when they get down into the red zone. They just – it's not there anymore. And it's – its I, I, I don't understand if it's play calling, if it's personnel, if it's a little bit of both. But if it's not a long touchdown, if it's not a 25-plus yard touchdown, chances are when they cross the 20, you're kicking – you're going for three and either you're going to – or turn it over on down. But rarely do they score in the red zone a touchdown. No, it's true. And again, some of that could be on coaching staff in terms of the play calling. Some of it's on we need to get and make sure we're in the right play, call timeout if it's not there, which we didn't see in the Michigan game. Uh, Some of it is, you know, knowing when to go for it and when not to. We've seen Jonathan Smith come out multiple times and say, well, maybe I should have done this differently or maybe I should have done that differently. So I think it's all together. And those are things that they have to be all on the same page because they're just not talented enough to overcome these little mistakes where you get down there and it's like, okay, we'll get it the next time. And it's like, it might not be a next time. And so so you have to take advantage of of the opportunities that are presented to you. And, you know, hopefully this is a game where they could do that. Now, Harold, going to to Illinois, I mean, you lose to Oregon. Everybody's lost to Oregon, but the Minnesota loss, like what 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 happened there? Because, I, you know, I I really don't understand it because you were at home. It's Minnesota. I, I guess I really thought they would shake it off. Was it just a case of Oregon beating them twice? Uh, potentially, I think the Big Ten. Honestly, if you take the top four teams 
and put them up here. And then you take Purdue and put them over there. Five through 17, you could pretty much throw in a hat and they could all beat each other. So I think you get a Saturday. Yeah, type of thing. B- between those, between those, what twelve or thirteen teams, I think it, everybody's pretty much the same. No, so, it, it, yeah, it's funny you say that because I, I look at like Iowa to me is the the biggest thing. Like one week they look like world beaters, the next week it's like, okay, what just happened to Iowa? I thought they were good. So yeah, maybe maybe you are correct. Um, another team that's really starting to intrigue me. Is, is UCLA. I think everybody kind of left them for dead. And they're slowly climbing their way into being bowl eligible as well, kind of like Michigan State. They're sitting there with four wins. They got Washington, uh, an old Pac-12 matchup under the new Big Ten umbrella. Washington, it's funny because what you say is is true. Because some weeks I'm thinking Washington is going to be good, and in other weeks I'm like, man, Washington's not ready for the Big Ten yet. But being that these are two Pac-12 teams, I, I'm assuming they know each other well. Even though both teams have new head coaches, what should we expect for this game? Going to be played in Seattle <clears throat> for Washington and UCLA. Well, I know for Washington, I'm certainly I would assume they would be glad to be back at Husky Stadium. They're five and zero when they play in that stadium. They're zero and five everywhere else, and so it seems like that crowd gets behind them, and that's when they get going. You know, they've won nineteen straight at home, uh, so I'm sure that they'll they'll have the home crowd behind them. But I've been really impressed with UCLA, and I think the schedule didn't do them any favors, especially with a first year head coach, and not just at that school, but just in general. And you're learning on the fly, and you got the the most travel of any team in the conference. You, you're going out to Hawaii, then you come home, you play Indiana, and you didn't know how good Indiana was going to be at that time. Then you go to LSU where it's 100 some degrees, you run out of gas there. Then you fly back home, you play Oregon, who's now the number one team in the country. Then you go out east and you go play Penn State without your quarterback. True. And so they didn't have – they just didn't have the schedule to set them up for success. They didn't have – the, the cupcake schedule where you could kind of find your footing. I mean, they got thrown into the fire right away. And for them to not give up on the season and for them to to improve each week, now that they're playing teams with similar talent, you know, they went out the Rutgers and won. They went to Nebraska and won. And then this last game against Iowa was really impressive. I mean, they dominated Iowa up front on both sides. They haven't been able to run the ball all year. And they were able to, to run it really well against Iowa. And, you know, Caleb Johnson, who's the best running back in the Big Ten, you know, he didn't do anything. You know, he, right. he was under 80 yards rushing. So, you know, I was really impressed with UCLA. I, I'm really fascinated at that matchup. I would lean Washington right now just because they seem to play much better at home. But UCLA overall is playing more consistent football. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you're right, but I like that stat. Washington's undefeated at home. I've been out to Husky Stadium. It's a really nice stadium right off the water. If nobody's ever been, when you your team gets to play Washington, I, I would definitely make that road trip out there. So, yeah, the other slate, other games on the slate, I, I think, you know, Ohio State's heavy favorite. Oregon's a heavy favorite. Um, yeah, Penn State, heavy favorite. I, I mean, I'm looking at the the college football playoff, and I'm I'm gonna say it bef- again. I said it before. I'm gonna say it again. James Franklin and Penn State are probably the happiest of this new format because you finally get the rewards. You finally will do just enough to get that next step, and not play in one of those uh, uh, New Year's New Six games, but you'll actually get a chance to win the title. In there, and you're probably going to end up with a home game at Happy Valley, which I think could be an advantage for them. That the whiteout, I tell people all the time, and that Penn State whiteout is something you got to see in person. It, it works because, unlike most stadiums, everybody wears white, everybody has the pom pom thing going, and it's not like, oh, I got to wear my lucky blue. No, 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 you're wearing white, it's the whiteout, it's intimidating. But, yeah, Penn State, Ohio State, Oregon, and Indiana, 
Harold, are we looking at all four of those teams making the college football playoffs? If you had to, to select it, do you think all four make it? I do. I do. Uh, I think the committee overcorrected. Uh, I thought Indiana should have been higher last week, but the fact that they played their worst game of the year, you know, beat a Michigan team that's only five and five and wound up jumping three spots and jumping ahead of Tennessee. You no, know, I thought that spoke volumes to me. Um, I think that they're getting a lot of love from the committee. I think people were trying, just waiting to see if they could put a performance together against a team that is a name brand. And even though Michigan is struggling, they are a name brand. And as long as they don't get blown out in Columbus, I think that they can get in at 11 and one. Now that doesn't mean that they would host a that they would you know be at home. They might have to go on the road and play that playoff game. But see, I gotta think of eleven and one Big Ten team though, especially if the number one team and the number two team are both in the Big Ten. You probably still would get a home game. It just seems like that to me because that's saying that as much as we love the SEC, maybe the Big Ten is a stronger conference this year. Well, I definitely think the top is, and the problem is Ohio State would have played everybody, but. Indiana would have only played Ohio State. Oregon would have only played Ohio State. Penn State would have only played Ohio State. So we don't really know because of that round robin, like how exactly it would have gone, how strong all of those teams really are. Uh, I, and then I always wonder in terms of, you know, ESPN and like the influence that's there, like hearing people say that I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave a, Three lost Georgia team out of the mix. Does that talk? See, like, Georgia's not really committee? passing. Georgia's not passing that eyeball test. Anymore. No, I agree. I agree with you. I'm just wondering how many people in that committee get swayed. There's usually like two or three people that that kind of take the charge, and then you know if they're pounding the table for the SEC being the best league, and hey, we got nine teams, and you know the only reason why we're ranked so low is because we keep playing all of these great teams. I wonder if any of that stuff gets involved, but I'm with you. Like, I think that the Big Ten has a great chance of it having one team obviously get the bye, and as it stands right now, they got three playing at home. And if, if it was up to me, if Indiana lost a close game at Ohio State and then they beat Purdue by, you know, 25, 30, whatever it winds up being, then – there's no reason for them to drop out of that top seven or eight, and they should be able to host a home. They so should be able to play at home. Wow. Uh, another, another, something else that came up that I uh, forgot to tell you about earlier. But Ohio State is now the latest team to complain about the times of the games. Do we got to rework this thing out? Because there's no way in the world Ohio State should be playing so many noon games. There's no way in the world Michigan State should be playing so many night games. Split the difference. Ohio State is good. I've always deemed night games as primetime games. I mean, you look at what, like, Alabama LSU. Now, it didn't end up being a good game, but, man, it was the buildup for that game. You find out in a couple weeks that it's going to be Ohio State and Indiana at noon. Ohio State's pretty much – they play Penn State at noon. They're going to play Michigan at noon. It's like I don't kind of like to see the Buckeyes under some lights. And even if you started at a 3.30 game, that's what I like to see. Now, what we did find out is Ohio State kind of picked that poison by signing that deal with Fox and saying, hey, we won't play games after daylight savings time at night. I, I got to think that somebody has to try to get an addendum or a change in that contract because you're, to me, you're hurting your brand because the noon game is stuff. I, I, I passively watch that game while I'm doing stuff around the house or you're in and out because you're doing stuff outside or you're running errands. You're not actively watching this Ohio State team when they're playing the, the different opponents. I don't know. To me, it just seems like the Big Ten has to step up and say, look, similar to what the NFL can do, we're going to flex some games. And if a game is big enough, we're going to take it out of the 12 spot, going to put it in the primetime spot. Hey, even if that week, uh, you know, I mean, I pr you probably couldn't do it because it's on a different day. But like Michigan State, Purdue, it's on Friday night. Maybe put that game on Friday night. Michigan State Purdue screams 12 o'clock to me. 
Heck, no, it, screams, I, it screams nine o'clock in the morning to me, but <laughs> you, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I definitely get what you're saying. Uh, and again, I don't disagree. I mean, as as a Michigan State guy, like I'm like, man, another night game, another night game. Like, you know, can I give my right arm for a noon game at this point? Uh, yeah, that definitely just seems to be an imbalance. And I get it. You know, the studies say, you know, the ratings are high and yada, yada, yada. But I do like the 330. Um, I, and, and I guess for me, I like a blend. I, I don't mind some noon. I know there's tradition with Ohio State, Michigan being at noon, and that's fine if you want to keep that at noon. But I hate every big game being at noon. Like, I just think that takes away from the fan experience. Yeah. You know, I think it takes away from the tailgating experience. And, you know, again, I get it. Business, business is business and money talks. And clearly the money is talking from, you know, all the money that these schools are making. But just from a, a fan experience, you know, I do think it'd be better if they were spread out. Now, I, I, I'm with you, man, because when I hear the ratings thing, it's like, OK, I get it. But Michigan, the ratings are high because of Michigan last year. Their fans are used to noon games and everybody wanted to watch. They got one of the largest fan bases across the country. So, yes, if you were to put Michigan on at 7 a.m., that would have been the biggest time slot. People would have watched that game. So that's what I think about that. Real quick before we end this. The Champions Classic, Michigan State loses to Kansas 77-69, three for 24 from the three-point line. Izzo says, my goodness, to paraphrase, so many wide-open shots we just couldn't make. You know, you got some grumblings now saying, hey, maybe they don't belong in the Champions Classic because they're not a champion. Where are you at with this? Where are you at with this team? I know it's early, but for me, Harold, I, I, you get tired of every year, it seems like, you, you lose this game. Matter of fact, you have the worst record of the four teams now in losing this game. Kentucky found a way to upset Duke, and now, you know, they have the thing. Well, they're, they're not dead last. Michigan State is now dead last. Thanks to that in Kansas. Kansas won Duke two, Kentucky three, Michigan State four. Yeah, it is frustrating because, you know, you seem to go into to this event and Michigan State's been unranked in a couple of them or they've been the lowest ranked of all four. You know, I feel like it's been a while since Michigan State has gone into that game with, with high expectations and has won a game of that magnitude. Um, I think overall, if you're just looking at the game itself, I think you can be encouraged at the fact that you didn't shoot it well at all and you were still able to be right there with the number one team in the country for 35, 36 minutes. And, and you know, again, I, I hate the moral victory thing. It'd be nice to win one of these big games. But, you know, I remember last year, you know, Michigan State couldn't shoot the three at all early in the season. You know, they were one of 20 against James Madison. And I think through three games, after they lost to Duke, they were eight of 50 from three and they wound up being a 36 percent team uh, from the three point line. So, you know, I know they've struggled to shoot it early this season, but I don't think that means that it's going to stay that way for the rest of the year. Uh, I think there's enough capable shooting on this team. We've seen, you know, we've seen Frankie Fiddler. He's a he's a 36 percent shooter from three. You know, Holloman shot over 40 percent. Aikens has been a guy that's been over 40 percent in the past. So I think there are shooters there. I was encouraged by Jackson Kohler. They actually were able to just dump it to him, and he was yeah. able to get a couple buckets. He was able to actually hit a three and stretch a defense. So if you're going to play the two bigs, you at least have one that can shoot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think there, I think there are a lot more positives than negatives, but it is frustrating to know that so again, it was another winnable game, and they didn't get a chance to to close it early in the season. Yeah, Jackson Kohler's three was the only one that really came in the floor of the game. Jace Richardson came right before the half, and and Fiddlers came late in the game when you were already out of it. <clears throat> so there was only one that really happened in the flow. You're right. They were close. I mean, if you're into the moral victory, yeah, you went up against the number one team. You get It was competitive. In fact, it was tied up until like the final five minutes of the game. They could never get over the hump, never can get the lead especially when two of your starters in in Aikens and Booker go one for 13, you know, you're going to have some problems. And when, when it comes to Xavier Booker, I mean, it should just be, Hey, we're not going to shoot threes for a while. 
Maybe we're going to use the fact that you're tall, put you down in the post, let you make some easier shots, get the confidence up, and once you do that, we'll let you shoot the threes. But right now, Harold, it looks like he just wants to be a three-pointer, and he forgets that, bro, you, you're like 6'10". Why don't you go down low in the post? And he's athletic, too. So we've seen him be able to, you know, shot fake, take a dribble, maybe shoot a little pull up, maybe go to the go to the rim and get fouled. You can shoot free throws. He's got a nice touch. So instead of just settling for three the entire time, do something else. And then the fact that he wasn't really doing much on the other end either, that's not going to help you stay on the floor if you're not making shots because he still looks very raw at this point. Uh, again, the talent is clearly there. Um, I think the fact that they were able to be in that game without two of their most talented players basically doing nothing uh, for that whole game, I do think helps them down the line. They're just they're a more athletic team this year. I think they're a tougher team this year. They've got a guy who can get to the free throw line and fiddler when it looks like things are bogging down. Uh, they're much more athletic. Uh, I think they're taller on the wing, which they haven't had in a while because there's so many times where Aikens is playing the three for the last two, three years. And anytime they played a dude that was six, 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 seven on the wing, it was always a, match, a mismatch problem. Now nah, I don't think they have that. So I, I think there's a lot of encouraging signs going forward. Maybe when it comes to the shooting, I don't know how far along uh, Kurt Tang is the freshman, but he's supposed to be one of the better shooters on the team. So I'd like to see him get some minutes too. He was. And the fact that you couldn't hit a three, I'm like, why not just put him in there? I, I mean, I think Jace Richardson is kind of eating his minutes some. But, yeah, I, at near the end, I know you're cold off the bench, son, and I probably shouldn't do this. But right now, nobody else can hit a three-pointer. This is what legends are made of. Can you go in there? Can you hit a three? Their next – potentially their next big test would be UConn and Maui in, in the second game if they beat Colorado which is ironic because it was a USA Today article saying, hey, UConn should be replacing them in that tournament game. I guess we'll wait to see. I mean, they're 0-7 against top five teams, which is a little deceiving because they've beaten the number six team twice. So, you know, people make stats to, 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 to fit their agendas and their narratives. But, yeah, last year they, they boat raced – uh, Baylor down at Little Caesars when they came in there and they were uh, number six in the nation. But yeah, it's, it's just frustrating when you see this team. And now, like I said, I look at Booker. I don't know. We're going into year two. I don't know when he's going to finally have that breakout game where you're like, yes, this is the guy we've been waiting on for a long time. He still looks lost out there. When I look at his body language, it just looks defeated like I, I knew once he made, missed that last three he was done for the night yeah pretty much and and they needed it too because you know Kansas has you know athletic team athletic front court you know if he would have made some threes that could have brought some of those guys out on the floor to, to try to guard him which opens up driving lanes for everybody else and, you know, unfortunately, since he wasn't on, they had to go with different lineups and they either had to play um, Cooper and Kohler together or we saw Cohen Carr a little more at the four, which I think right. is his best position. Um, and so he was able to take advantage of some of the minutes and Booker wasn't playing that well. But again, I think they have a lot of options that they didn't have last year. And, and so I think that they could do some good things this year. And it, as for the Champions Classic part, I get it. They haven't you know, won these games in November. But if you're looking at March, can't really say Kentucky's done a ton in March recently either. So, and, you know, we just saw Kansas get blown out in the second round by Gonzaga. So, you know, just because you didn't win the games in November doesn't mean that you, you know, what, what you're doing in November doesn't necessarily translate to what yeah. it's going to be in March. You know, we've seen Michigan State get better you know, the last couple of years, obviously, they've, they've needed to do more. But I think it's a little short-sighted to just try to replace the team, especially with, with UConn, who was in the abyss for a decade before Dan Hurley got it going. Fair enough. But still got, what, six titles in the uh, last 25 well, yeah, years? Yeah, once they once they get to the Final Four, they they kill it. Like, I, about say, no I, I, I don't think any, I think every fan base will say, you know what, I'll go into the abyss. For four years, if it means six titles in 25 years. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, like this, they, 
they they get it done once they get once they get there they finish the deal there's no doubt about it all right harold i appreciate your time uh we'll be back next week to preview next week's games but for right now thanks for watching keep liking subscribing for Hell Sheldon, i'm rico beard thanks for watching the five star zone